Hey guys, it's Tammy. Today I wanted to try and go over some of the various things that you can use to do macro photography. The different camera systems that you can have, the different lenses, and the different accessories that you can use to do some macro photography. So let's get started. System. This is a crop sensor camera. This is my Canon 7D. Um, I got rid of my uh, Canon 6D full frame when I went to a mirrorless system, um, but I kept my 7D uh, because I loved the way it worked with macro, and I kept my macro lens and my extension tubes. So we're going to go over this first. Now, um, for 35 uh, millimeter DSLRs, um, there are several things that you can use <clears throat> for um, macro photography and I'm going to start out with the most simplest thing a telephoto lens this is Canon 70 to 300 IS image stabilization and it is an f 4 to 5 6 lens this is an excellent lens for macro photography and for close-up photography and the reason I say that is because with a zoom lens it allows you to compress your image um, it also allows you to be further from your subject it allows you to um, get a dragonfly or a damselfly at a distance so that you don't scare it off, um, but it also gives you a really good quality. <clears throat> now I used this lens, this was my lens, um, and I uh, used this for several years before I upgraded to a proper, what I consider a proper macro lens, um, only because I wanted to try it out and see what it was like. I never owned one and I really wanted to try a macro lens. Um, but this works great and like I said I use this for quite a while and um, you really can get some great images with the zoom lens and the reason being is because with the zoom lens you're compressing the image which means that you're taking that image and you're squishing it and what it does is it creates a shallow depth of field behind your subject. That's why zoom lenses, you normally see a portrait photographer using a 1 to 400 um, or, a folk, or a longer focal length lens because it allows you to get that shallow depth of field even at a distance. So that's why zoom lenses are great for macro photography is they allow you to compress that image and gives you a great shallow depth of field behind your subject um, if you do not have a macro lens. So those are very great. Um, the other thing that, that you can use is you can also use a wide angle lens. Most people don't think about this, but this is a 10 to 20 Sigma. It's a constant 3.5, um, but it gives you the ability to get in close and do some macro. They have, the newer lenses now, have the ability to get in really close with a um, wide angle lens and you can do really great close-up photography because wide angle lenses have, are very sharp. Um, the only thing you have to be careful of when you're shooting at that wide angle is you get the distortion, you get the barrel distortion in your lens. Um, but that all depends on the maker of the lens um, and what camera you have. And I'll explain that when I go over to the mirrorless system. But I've actually used um, a wide angle lens for macro and it worked really well. I've not tried it with this lens. Um, I gave this lens to a friend of mine uh, who has this equipment um, except for a couple things. And I've never tried with this particular lens, but I have with others. So you can also use a wide angle lens, uh, but you just have to play around and find what focal length is good for you without creating that barrel distortion. The other thing you can move on to is you can move on to a prime lens. This is a 50 millimeter 1.8 prime and I have used this for macro photography before and it works really really well. My friend uses this to do miniatures quite a bit and it gives you great great shallow depth of field um, and it works really really well to allow your subject to stand out from its background. Um, for macro photography, you really want your subject to stand out 
from the background. You do not want it to blend. And the 50 millimeter prime allows you to do that. Um, you can use other prime lenses as well, an 85, a 50, um, whatever prime lens you have. Try it and see. You might not like it, but then again, you never know what you're going to get. So you can always try that. Now, the other thing you can use is one of the things that a lot of macro photographers have in their kit and that is extension tubes. Now what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about the difference between extension tubes and teleconverters. They are two totally different things. Extension tubes are basically just tubes. There's no glass in here whatsoever. It is just a tube where when you're talking about an extender, a teleconverter, it has a glass element inside of it. What they do are totally different things, and I'll go over those. With I'll go over the teleconverter first. With a teleconverter, what this does is it allows you to take a lens, let's say the 70 to 300, and what you do is you place the teleconverter on the back of your lens, and it goes the same way with extension tubes. It goes between your lens and your camera. And what it does is it, it takes the effective focal length of your lens at 70 to 300 and extends it, it converts it to 150 to 600. So when you put this on here, it literally extends the focal length of your lens from 70 to 300 to 150 to 600. Now, this is a teleconverter that I had back in the film days that I purchased, and I've just continued to use it throughout the years, but as I've upgraded the lenses, the problem with teleconverters is, one, you lose two stops of light because it's a 2x teleconverter. They used to make a 1.4 as well, and if you purchase newer lenses now through Nikon or the Canon L lenses or even Sigma and Tamron, you can buy teleconverters for those specific lenses only that are 1.4. And that effectively takes that lens and extends it 1.4 times. So you're losing either 1.4 stops of light or you're losing two stops of light whenever you're using these on your camera. So you have to be aware of that when you're using them with these lenses because if you're trying to hand hold and you're trying to shoot your subject, that's gonna slow it down and that's going to make it so that you have to, sorry, my dog is snoring under the table. <laughs> up. So you have to make it so that you take that into consideration when you're using these. They work really, really well, and they can get you into some areas and take some shots that you would not have been able to get otherwise. So that's your teleconverter. When you're talking extension tubes, like I said, you're just using a hollow tube, but they come in three different sizes for your DSLR, and they come in a 12, a 20, and a 36 millimeter. These are made by Kinko. There are several manufacturers now that make these, and these were tubes that I got back in film days that I've just used throughout um, to this day, still use them, they still work, not a problem. Um, but what you do is you have three different sizes. So you have your 36, you have your 20, and then you have your 16. And basically what these do is they do not act like a teleconverter. They do not affect your lens the same way as a teleconverter does. What they do is they allow you to focus closer to your subject. So if you take the 36 millimeter one and you place it on your camera lens, it does not make this lens a, um, let's just use the 100 because it's a little easier for math and I suck at math. You got my 100 millimeter macro. If you take the 36 millimeter extension tube and you place it behind it, that does not make this lens a 136 millimeter lens. They don't work that way. This remains a 100 millimeter macro lens at f2.8. What it does allow you to do is, for instance, let's say you are taking a photograph with this lens and your focal distance, the distance you are allowed to focus from here to here is this. When you put this extension tube on, you can move closer. It extends the focal length of your lens. Meaning, I'm sorry, not the focal length, the focus distance. 
of your lens. So <clears throat> you can get closer in on your subject, but it also allows, it also changes your depth of field to a certain degree. Your shallower, your shallow depth of fields become even more shallow. Um, what you would normally get at a 5.6 without an extension tube is not what you're going to get with one. Um, what you would normally get at an f8 without an extension tube is not what you're going to get with one. It changes both things. With extension tubes, you can use each one of these separately or you can stack them. Now here's a trick. When you're using extension tubes, they have to be stacked in size. You can't do a 16 with a 36. Um, not with the old film ones. With the newer ones you probably can, but with these you cannot. I've tried it and it didn't work out so well. So when you're using these, you have to stack them 36, 20, 16, but you can use all three of these on the back of your lens. And you can get really, really close. I mean literally right up on your subject. The best thing to do when you buy these, and I got these for probably about 50 bucks off of um, Amazon. Actually, no, I got these from B&H way back in the day. Um, you play with these. See what you like, see what you don't like. See which combinations of the extension tubes work for you and what ones you really like. Because like I said, they do change their depth of field to a certain degree. Um, and you'll learn over time when you look at something and you know I want this at this, that what these extension tubes will give you. So this is another way that you can do that as well. Now, the final way, well not the final way, but the big way is to buy an actual macro lens. This is the expensive way of doing it. Macro lenses aren't cheap. Um, they are heavy. They are lots of glass inside of here. And this is the 100 millimeter f.28, f2.8, oh jeez, macro lens from Canon. It is not image stabilization. This is the one that came out before the image stabilization version. Um, I've had this for a few years now, and it was my first macro lens. I did decide to keep this along with my... 7D and my extension tubes um, because I love the way that the crop sensor camera does with um, the macro. And this is what you would normally do if you were going to get really serious into macro. However, you can be really serious into macro and not go the macro lens route. It's all personal preference and all personal choice. You do not need a macro lens to do macro and close-up photography. Just like I said, you can use a wide angle lens, you can use a zoom lens, you can use extension tubes and teleconverter, you can even use a prime. It's all personal preference and personal choice. There is no right way and no wrong way just in anything. It's whatever works for you and whatever your budget is. Um, you can get a simple macro kit for less than $150. You don't need, if you already have a lens, <laughs> you don't need to go out and buy a whole bunch of fancy fangled lenses and accessories to do macro. But I chose to go this way because I was getting very seriously into it and I wanted I wanted a sharp, clear image um, and that's what this macro lens gave me. Now, they come in different sizes. This is a 100 millimeter. Um, they make a 90, um, there's a 180. There's different manufacturers have different focal lengths. So you need to decide um, based on your subjects and what you're going to primarily be photographing, which one you chose. I chose this one because at the same time I was also doing portraits, and this is a beautiful, beautiful portrait lens. It gave me that beautiful bouquet, soft background, uh, because it allowed me to get further away from my subject. Your backgrounds on as, as far as your depth of field is how far away from your subject you are. That's why I love doing things with the... Um, with your zoom lenses because it gets you further from your subject. So that's why I chose the 100 millimeter. Now the other way that you can go is a filter system. And these, I use these for years. This is a friend of mine. I don't have mine anymore. I got rid of mine years ago. Um, and what these are, are they're little filters in two, four, and 10. Actually his are plus one, uh, plus two, 
and plus four. Now you can get them, Vivitar makes them in a plus one, plus two, plus four, and plus ten. Um, and they just screw on the front of the lens that you want to use them on, whether you're going to use your prime or, you know, whether you're going to use your zoom lens or whatever lens, and you buy them for that size. These, I think, are 58s. Yes, these are 58 millimeter filters, and you just screw them on the front and you play. Um, the one thing about these is sometimes manual focus is what you have to do. Autofocus won't work with some of these because you have to either focus them manually or move in and out with them. And it all depends on what you want to do. These are by Quantare, which is an older company that's, I don't know if they're around anymore, um, but they used to be part of Ritz Camera. And that's, these are great for beginners. If you've never done macro and you have no idea what you want to do and you just want to play, you can get a set of Vivitar ones on Amazon for seven, I think it's seven or eight bucks, and you can play. There's four of them on there. You just choose the lens that you want to go with, and then you just play. And it gives you a good idea of what you want to do. Now, with some of these filters um, and with the extension tubes, you're going to need something that allows you to move back and forth, and that is called a focus rail. That's what this is. And what this does is you have little handles here that you can move your focus rails forward and backward, forward and backward, and side to side. And this allows you to focus very minutely and pinpoint on your subject. And there are several instances where you might want to do that depending upon what you're using, and that's what these are designed for. Now, I bought these for a specific purpose, and when I get to the mirrorless system, I'll explain. Now, with a crop sense camera, <clears throat> Canon is a 1.6 crop. Nikon is, I think, a 1.5. I don't shoot Nikon, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a 1.5. And what that does is that effectively makes my 70 to... Um, or not my 70 to 300, I'm sorry, my 100 millimeter macro, a, um, I think it's a 120, and it makes the 70 to 300 an 85 to 420. So it literally takes your millimeters, your, your length of your lens, and times it by 1.6. So you're getting more out of your lens with a crop sensor. I love that over full frame. I like the quality of full frame, don't get me wrong. I really don't see a difference between my crop sensor and my full frame. But I really like that, so that's why I kept it. Moving over to the Micro Four Thirds in my Olympus system is a bit different. There is a big difference doing macro in the DSLR as compared to Micro Four Thirds, and I'll explain why. I got the Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II, and I love this camera. I basically have macro ability with any lens that I use on this camera. It doesn't matter what lens it is. This 12 to 40, I can get very close. And I took this image. And this image. With the 12 to 40. And it, they came out great. I absolutely love these lenses. They're very clear, they're very sharp, but the one thing I had to learn when I moved from a DSLR over to mirrorless is the crop changed my f-stops. Here's why. This is a 1.6 crop sensor in this camera from full frame. This is a two crop sensor from full frame. So whatever I put on here is by two. So that means that my 12 to 40 that I have on here now becomes a 24 to 80 in full frame equivalent. So do my f-stops, which means if this is a 2.8, it's effectively a 5.6 in a full frame equivalent. So what I'm going to get at 2.8 on this camera or a full frame camera does not look the same on this camera. So you have to be aware of that when you're going from a digital SLR to a mirrorless system. It's going to change. And that's taken me some time to get used to because I used to be able to use this camera, look at a flower and say, I want that at a 2.8 or 5.6, set my camera, shoot it, boom, it's right exactly what I wanted. 
when I went to mirrorless, in the beginning I wasn't aware of that, and I would shoot it exactly the same, and I'd be looking at my pictures like, what the? It doesn't look anything like what I thought it would. And then that's where that came in, and I had to learn all that over again. So there is a small learning curve, even with landscape. There's a learning curve. So with the mirrorless system, I can use my 12 to 40. I can use my 40 to 150. This lens, believe it or not, it looks huge compared to the 7 to 300, 70 to 300. Um, but this sucker will get in so close. I've literally gotten right on top of what I'm shooting. It is an amazing lens for macro photography, and I used it for this picture. Now, the other thing is I have the 75 to 300, um, which is not part of their, M it's part of their Mzuko series, but it's not a pro lens. Um, it's an ED lens, which means that it doesn't have the internal um, image stabilization. All of these have internal image stabilization in not only the lens, but I also have it in the camera. Excuse me, this one does not. This is still weatherproof. Um, and it's dust proof and all of that, but it does not have an internal focusing system or image stabilization system. So um, you have to take that into consideration also when you're doing macro. And I'll explain why when we get to the tripod section. This is an excellent, excellent lens. This is a great lens for macro photography. And I took this picture. With this lens. Um, I was very surprised at how well this lens did and it was handheld. I did not have a tripod. I had one with me but up until about four, three or four years ago I never hand, I never tripod anything macro. I always handheld. Well, I'm getting older <laughs> and I can't be as um, steady anymore because I have a shoulder injury so this was amazed me how great this turned out. This is a great lens, and I got in really nice and close with that. The other thing is, is this is another wide angle. I have the Olympus 7 to 14, 2.8, um, but I wanted something that I didn't have to carry two filter systems with me because the element on the front of that 7 to 14 is so large that you can't, and it doesn't have a screw on filter system, you had to buy an adapter for it, and the adapter vignette's really bad. So I went with the Leica Lumix G 8-18, to and it is a 2.8, and this gets very, very close. I was extremely surprised, and this has no barrel distortion. My 7-14 to used to until the newest firmware update, but there's no distortion to this whatsoever. It does not fisheye, it does not curve, it's, I really like this lens. Um, so you can still use wide angle in your micro four thirds. Now, this little guy right here is tiny. Both of those are macro lenses. This is a 60 millimeter macro 2.8. It's part of their Pro Series. It is weatherproof. It is dust proof. It is splash proof. It is freeze proof. I wish it did my laundry, but you know, what are you going to do? But the difference between these two, I can put this in my pocket and walk around and forget it's there. It's so light, whereas compared to the tank is what I call this, I can't do that. However, the quality is superb. I took this image. with the Olympus, and I took this image with the Canon, and I was very surprised at how they came out. Um, this also has settings on it for different focusing distances, and it has the one-to-one -one ratio on it. One-to-one -one ratio is um, Literally, you're taking whatever you're photographing and you're making it a one-to-one -one ratio, which means what you're seeing now is what you're going to get when you look at this. There's nothing, no distortion, no, oh, no nothing. It's amazing. But when you use that on here, you have to have a focusing reel. You cannot manually focus, you, nor can you autofocus with this. You have to have it on a focusing reel because you have to literally dial in and pinpoint your focus point, which is why I have the focusing rails. So, which back in the day used to be called bellows because it had a big old bellow on it. <laughs> so, 
this is a great little lens and it's so lightweight and it allows me to get in there and get very, very close, even closer than my 100 millimeter uh, macro with Canon, which really surprised me. Now with micro four thirds, you also have extension tubes. Um, with teleconverters, the only teleconverter that they have is the 1.4 that goes with the 40 to 150 and the 300 millimeter um, lens that they have, which is a lot bigger than this one. It only fits those two. Um, and I have it for this one for various reasons, and I've used it several times, but I didn't feel the need to have it with the mirrorless system for any of the other lenses. It just didn't make sense, and I don't own the 300. Um, so I bought extension tubes because I will use the extension tubes. And with mirrorless, you only get two. Um, you get a 10 millimeter and a 16 millimeter. <clears throat> Excuse me. And like I said, they're still just hollow tubes with nothing in there. It's not glass or anything. You lose no light by using these, just the same as with the digital SLR. And they just go on the bottom of any lens that you choose to use them on. I can use them with the 12 to 40. I can use them with the 75. I can use them with the 60. I can use them with whatever lens I want. And they just go on between the camera and your lens, I can stack them or I can use them separately from one another. And they effectively work the same way. I just got these, so I haven't used them yet. Um, I can't wait to get them out and use them this year. <clears throat> but I, they're a lot of fun to play around with. Now the other thing that you can do, as with any of these, and I'm going to move some of these off to the side, um, you also have the option of doing an art type of macro photography. And what I mean by art macro photography is, is you have the ability to use what's called a lens baby. Lens baby is a different type of lens altogether and what it does is it takes the this is a lens baby. It's just a lens on a ball that goes onto your camera. And in the front of here is what they call optics. And what the optics are, are they're little different types. There's a double glass, there's a plastic, there's a pinhole, um, and there's a, a few others. You can also get larger optics that cost a lot of money, um, and you can do macro with this. And I took this image, with the plastic optic in the Composer Pro. And that's what this is. And what it does is you place it on the front of your camera and you choose the optic you wanna go inside. And your f-stops, this is all manual. It's manual focus, manual everything. So you don't have to worry about anything. But your f-stops are controlled by these little discs. And the discs just fall down inside. There's a magnet in there that holds it in and it doesn't fall out. And when you want to change them, you just have a little magnet on here and you grab a hold of it and it pops right out. And the f-stops go from 2.8 to 22. So you have the full range here. Or you can choose to do it even without anything in there. So you have options with the lens baby. Now when you're using the lens baby, it's actually very cool how it works. It works like a tilt shift lens. Not the same, but very close. What you do is you put it on your lens and you focus on whatever point on the subject that you want to focus on. And then you put your f-stop ring inside. And normally I like to do that last because this opens this entire area up without it and allows me to actually get a different picture. Put your ring in there. And then there's a ring right back here by the very back that you unlock it. You just turn it to unlock it. And what that does is it allows you to move this front element all around. And the way a lens baby works is if you focus in the center of whatever it is you want to photograph, you unlock and you move this, it moves that focus point. So you can literally do all types of different effects, different focus places. It blurs the rest of your image out and gives it almost like a dreamy, sci-fi ethereal feel and you can get some really cool effects with it. I took this image
with the lens baby and I took this image with the lens baby. Now, the thing about the lens baby is it comes with two macro options. When you buy the lens baby, you get two macro filters. And they just screw right into the top. And they just sit right there on top. They come in a four and a 10. I didn't like them. Um, I like a little bit more control over my um, macro and I felt that they were just kind of odd. It just, when you moved the lens baby element in the front, it just kind of shifted things odd and I didn't care for it. So I decided to go ahead and get the macro converter that you can get to go with it and then your optic sits down inside of here. So this yellow circle in the center of here, you take that out, that's the optic, and it looks like this. It's a little black optic. You put this inside of here and then Sorry about that, had some technical difficulties. So the little optic just drops down inside the macro converter rings. And then this drops down inside the Composer Pro. And it sets it off inside a little bit so that it actually magnifies. I didn't like them because I didn't like how it looked. It was not um, mac magnified enough for me. It didn't work as well as I thought it was going to. So that's when I decided to use the um, extension tubes with the lens baby. It worked a lot better and it gave me more magnification, allowed me to get a little closer, and I liked the blurriness of the images and the ethereal feel to them. It, it was a lot more of what I was looking for. Um, the other thing that I purchased was what they call the Edge 80. And this is actually a optic where the f-stops are on it, the blades are inside. So you literally adjust your f-stops on the um, optic itself by turning the dial. And this um, is great for portraits. I've seen landscape done with this, some beautiful black and whites. Um, it's one of those lenses where you can stand on a hill and take a photograph of a village or a town and it makes it look miniature. It makes it look like a small scale village that someone built like a train set or something like that. And that's what I bought it for to try and see. I've played with it a couple of times. Um, otherwise it just sits. I paid about $300 for it and I have not used my lens baby since I purchased my Olympus um, because I've just not had a chance to get out and play with it, but I, I'm planned to do a day of just lens baby stuff. But I had bought an adapter since this is all manual focus and manual f-stop control and everything. Um, I bought an adapter so that it does fit onto my Olympus because this was made for Canon. Um, that is one thing I wanted to say really quick is whenever you're switching camera systems from a um, DSLR to a mirrorless system and you have a lens baby, um, don't buy a new one. I was not aware that there was an adapter made for this, so I went to the camera store to buy a new Composer um, Pro. Well, the Composer Pro is this and the optic that goes inside. And the lady behind the counter, who's a good friend of mine, her name is Deb, and she is really into Lens Baby. And she says, don't buy a new Lens Baby, buy the adapter. And I was like, an adapter? And she said, yes. You just purchase a manual adapter that allows you to use your Canon lenses on your Olympus, all of them. I can use all of those lenses that were for the DSLR on my Olympus, but it's all manual. And it works great. Um, I took a few pictures with it and it worked really well. Saved me $300 and I got the adapter for 20 bucks. So that's a tip right there. If you have one of these, don't buy a new one. Now the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, there's two things that are crucial for macro photography. One of them is light and the other one is a tripod. We're going to go over the tripod first. When you're doing macro photography, the one thing that you really want to invest in is a good sturdy tripod. I'm not talking about a Walmart $20 tripod or a Best Buy $40 tripod. I'm talking a good sturdy tripod. I'm also not referring to a $1,000 Enduro or one of the other tripods that are six, seven hundred dollars That's just overkill. 
I'm talking a good sturdy carbon fiber tripod, one that's gonna be lightweight for you to carry while you're out. And number two, that's gonna take the weight of your camera, your lenses, and be able to stay nice and steady. Piece of advice, and everyone knows this, if you're gonna do macro or you're going to tripod mount your camera in any way, turn off your image stabilization. It's crucial for macro. Reason being is that motor is shifting inside of your lens or in your camera. It's constantly moving. It's moving and causing camera shake. So any image that you're going to take is going to show a blur to a certain degree because of that movement. So turn off your image stabilization in your camera or on your lens so that you don't get that. Also, if you're photographing in high wind, um, I don't have them with me right now. My husband has the car and they're in the back of my car. There are two things that you can purchase. Um, one's called a Wimberly clamp um, and the other one is a clamp on a stake. And you can actually put them, clip them to your tripod. I'll show them to you whenever I go out in the field because I do use them. Um, but they attach to your tripod and they will hold a flower delicately or a branch so that it stops it moving in the wind. Photographing macro in high wind is difficult at best because any vibration in your in your tripod will show up on your images or in your camera. So always keep that in mind. The tripod that I have right now that's filming this is a Benro. I love it. It's a small aluminum lightweight tripod. It's a travel tripod. Um, it's a great tripod. I really, really like it for holding my vlogging camera or if I'm just going to go out in the city and do something simple. But I do have a larger tripod which is a Benro, um, it's called the Benro Go Plus Travel. It is the 28C version. There's also a smaller version, which is the 18C. Um, they didn't have that at the time when I needed another tripod, so I purchased this one. The thing about this tripod I love the most is the telescoping ability that it has. About eight years ago, I purchased a Vanguard, which is still sitting in the corner, still works great. It's my backup tripod that has the telescoping center column and I'll show you what that is in a second but I loved it for macro photography if you're going to buy any type of a head for your tripod do a ball head don't get a pistol grip um, do a ball head because it allows you to maneuver and get into different angles and things a little bit better than a pistol grip does but the thing with this tripod is what it does on the the head and the center column now, the center column on this is able to what they do, telescope. And the Vanguard AT series is the same way. And I know Manfrotto makes a small tripod that does this. They also make, Manfrotto makes one that's on a ball. And you bring it out and you can maneuver it around. My friend has that one and he really likes it. But this one, you extend your center column up and there's two buttons you push on the bottom. And then you push it through. It clicks and then tips over. And then what you can do with this is you can literally move this in any configuration up or down and 360 degrees. So you can literally set this all the way to the ground. The legs go all the way down flat to the ground and then I'm still getting used to how this works. <laughs> And then you can literally maneuver this however you want. And with it being on a ball head, I can turn it, twist it, tilt it, everything, and get in any position that I want to get And This has come handy so many times, particularly with my Vanguard. I used it like crazy, um, and I, I love this. When I found out Benro had that ability, I was like, yay, and so I got one. Um, but this extends it, you can go all the way back. The one thing I wanna say about when you extend it all the way out or even most of the way out, you're gonna have your camera on the end of here. It will tip, so you have to be very careful of that, especially if you have your legs up um, and you're taking a picture over a railing at a waterfall or anything like that, you do not want this to tip over, so you have to hold on or put some weight on this one end. The other thing you could do is um, they make little uh, trays that you can attach to the bottom of here, the little web trays. Sorry, my dogs are playing in the background. And um, you can lay things in the center and add weight to your tripod that way. So there, there are options that you can do for that. And then when you're done, you just push it up, push it down, lock it down, and you're done. And so you have in this little tripod, 
This is actually smaller and lighter than my Vanguard, and that's one of the reasons why I chose it as well. I wanted something a little bit smaller, um, but I really, really love this Benro. Benro is a great company. Vanguard is an amazing company as well, um, but I really like this tripod. You can also go with a tabletop tripod. Um, you can go with this little Pro, uh, Pro Master. Um, it's great. I've used this before. Um, you can literally take and extend the center column up and all the legs out and get all the way down. And these legs will extend out even more so you can get all the way down and then you have your ball head with your camera and this will hold a DSLR and a mirrorless camera. It is designed for that and you can literally get right literally on your subject. So this is a great little camera to keep in your backpack or in your car or whatever. And if you just know you're going to be going out somewhere simple, then you can just pop your camera on this bad boy and you're set to go. It is heavy. And I mean not heavy, heavy. It's sturdy. And it has some heft to it. So this is another great option. You also have the option of using what's called a Joby. Sorry, mine is bent <laughs> like crazy. This is the Joby 3K. And this is the Joby for GoPro. They make a 5K, but it's a little bit bigger than this one, and it was a little bit too heavy for what I wanted. Um, I used this one for the longest time and decided to upgrade to a little bit bigger one, especially for putting my other lens on, the bigger lens on this camera. I love these. They literally will go all the way down as well. You can bend them around tree branches. You can bend them onto whatever. They will go anywhere, and they're awesome in your bag. I just fold this one up. And I stick this on the side of my Shimoto behind my tripod bag, and it fits perfectly there, and it stays. It does not move. So, you know, you can put these in your bag. You can put them anywhere. I like them on the outside of the bag so I can get them to them a little bit faster. But these you can use. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was light. Light is the number one thing for photography. You don't have light, you don't have a picture. So, with macro photography, up until about two or three years ago, I never used external light. I never used a flash. I never used a ring flash. I never used anything. Every now and then, I would, underneath a mushroom, I would take my flashlight out of my bag and shine it up underneath and add a little pop to the edges of a mushroom. But and recently, I've noticed a lot of people using it. And about two or three years ago, I purchased a ring flash. And I took this image with the ring flash. First time I ever used one. That image that I just showed you was the first image I took with this ring flash in my kitchen on a calla lily. And I fell in love. So this is for my Canon system. It does fit the Olympus, but it hangs off the back a little and I don't want it to hurt my camera. So if you're going to do macro, a ring flash is great. You don't have to spend a lot of money on a ring flash, honestly. This cost me $120. It is a Yong Nu or Yong Now off of Amazon, and it works beautifully. It's ETTL, and it, I can make all kinds of adjustments, compensations, everything on here. I just recently picked up this one. Um, it's a Pro Master. It also is... Um, capable of doing everything that one is doing, um, but it works great with my mirrorless camera. I just purchased this, so I've not been able to use it yet. I literally took it out of the box today, um, but I can't wait to get it out and try it and see how it works. Uh, they had just used this on a Olympus when I was there, and it, the image was beautiful, so I can't wait to try this, but a ring flash works really, really well. It's soft, diffused light, and it's around the front of your lens, so it's not harsh, stark light on your subject. And for macro, I don't like that. That was one reason why I never used flash on any of my macro before is because I, I like the natural light. I'm a natural light shooter. So this works really, really well. Um, so if you want a flash for macro, a ring light works really well. This one was $99. If you don't have that kind of money, I've got this little handy dandy guy right here. This is the take me to your leader light. This was $29. And what you do with this is you literally just slide this into your hot shoe, clamp it down, I, and you can adjust these 
in any position that you want. And these little lights are pretty bright. I mean, they're little LEDs, and they're actually pretty bright, and they come with different settings. You can do high, low, oh, sorry, I'm playing again. <laughs> but you can adjust these however you want. You can adjust one coming up below, one going up above, and they take a pin light battery, two pin light batteries. So, and it folds up fairly easily, and it goes compact in your bag. So this is not taking up as much space as a ring flash would or your larger flashes that you would have in your bag. This is the Canon 600X EXRT, which I purchased for a wedding and a senior shoot, and I've not used it since, and that was a year and a half ago. So, you know, you're looking at the size difference in these two things. It's quite a big difference, and this folds up. So you can use a conventional flash for macro. I just choose not to. Um, I don't like the light that it gives, but you might. So play around with your flash. You can buy diffusers for them. Um, the other tip I have, I'll show you here in a second for flash. Um, but you can do all types of things with light. Um, so this for $29, this is made by ProMaster. I really, really do like it. I do like ProMaster products. Um, I use quite a lot of their products. They're great. They last because I'm hard on my stuff. So this is actually a good buy. Now, the other thing that you can use is you can use what's called a bounce filter. Now, I have this one. It's off of Amazon. It's made by Trumagen. It's a seven, or seven, wait, a five in one. And what I mean by that, it pops open. Ha ha! Ta -da. It's a white reflector on one side. A gold reflector on the other side however I feel like I need circus music or something on the inside you flip this over and you have a silver reflector and a black background now I purchased this to do orchids at the botanical gardens because I can literally take this and hold it up behind my orchid and have a black background to set that orchid off but in the center of it is a diffuser. Now this is a key ingredient in macro photography on bright sunny days. What you do with this is you have your flower. Oh, what am I pulling that over for? I have a flower. You've got harsh, stark sunlight coming down on top of this flower and you're trying to figure out how am I gonna cut off that light? It's too bright. Well, you place this over it and it diffuses the light going through it onto your subject. Now you can use this for products. You can use this outside to shoot a video for like a product that you don't want. You can get these at 55 inches. I have a 55 inch in my attic back when I had my studio. But this is 12 inch um, diffuser that comes with the cover. And you literally can use it to adjust how the light is hitting your subject. And it diffuses the light. Now, if you are using this or you're out on a day that's really cloudy and yucky and it's dark and groupy and you know the embrace the gray kind of day you can actually take a flashlight or these lights or your ring light as a constant light and shine it through this onto your subject and it diffuses that light and creates a soft light I've done that many many times and it works really really well so you have options and you know you've got your silver which creates a pretty you know pretty harsh light then you have your white which is a soft diffused light I don't know if you can see it on my face or not then you have gold which supposedly tries to give you a 10 Ooh, and I know toasted anyway but this is more for modeling, and you need a bigger one for that. You can also use this for macro for certain flowers and stuff, but I don't like the light that comes off of it. So this is one way to control your light. So you have options. Now, my very first reflector that I ever had was an egg-shaped one that I made out of white fabric and PVC tubes. <laughs> it's still in my attic. So this is another option that you can use as your reflector, and it gives you that light bounce that you need to bounce back onto your subject. So that if you don't want to use a flash, or you really just don't want to carry a flash, it folds up compact, it goes right back in this little case, you zip it up, 
and I keep it right here in the front of my Shimoto bag in the bottom because it's so much easier for me to get to and I use that all the time. I actually carry this in my teeth when I'm walking through the woods because I'm constantly using it. Um, or I clip it to the front of my bag because I know I'm going to eventually grab a hold of this. So that is one tip I would definitely suggest that if you're going to do macro, get yourself a diffuser. You can buy these as a regular diffuser with um, a cover that comes with a white on one side, silver on the other, and the diffuser in the center, or you can just buy a diffuser. It's totally up to you. I got mine off Amazon for $13, so they're not expensive. If you're going to use a conventional flash, the one thing I would suggest you do is to get a diffuser for the front or get what they call a soft box. Gary Fong makes one. Um, there's a, a conventional soft box that slides on. Um, don't do it straight on. You're going to get a lot of harsh light and it's going to blow your subject right out of the water unless you know how to compensate manually on your flash. So play around, see what you like and see how that works for you. Um, light is one of the most crucial things in macro photography. You will either make or break your image. And you can do all kinds of fun stuff. You can have flashlights that have red, green, and blue light. Um, it just is all a matter of what you prefer and what you like. There's no right way and no wrong way. How I do it may not be how you do it or how someone else does it. So if someone tells you, oh, you should have used a flash on that, well, you can kindly explain, I'm sorry, but I like natural light, and this is how I choose to do it. You're taking photos for you. So, you know, that's basically what I tell people. Now, this is another thing that I've used a couple of times. I purchased this a few years ago. I've used it like three times. It's called a Hoodman Loop. What it does is it allows you to put this onto the back of your LCD screen, to view your images after you take them to make sure they're in clear, sharp focus. Now with the new mirrorless systems, we have what's called focus peaking, where whenever we manually focus, and I'll, I'll go into focusing in another video, it turns red where it's in focus, and we can see exactly where our focus is on here, so I don't use this. On my Canon, I used it a few times, but I can't get used to looking through this. In the film days and, and slide days, I used to use these on a light box to check my... <laughs> Sorry, to check my film to make sure that I had everything correct. Girls, stop. So, you know, these are, they're great if you want to use one. I paid about 120 for this about five or six years ago, so they're not cheap. Um, they've changed since I bought mine, so they might be a little different now. But this is a Hoodman Loop, and I think they come in various sizes now. Um, this was the only one they had available when I purchased it. I got this at a macro convention several years ago um, the gentleman who was hosting it um, had these for sale and I purchased one so I may or may not use this again I don't know but it's an option so that's basically how I do my macro and what I use to do my macro there are other things that I will bring with me that I don't necessarily have out here but generally that's how it works um, if you have any questions or you don't understand something or there's something that you see here you have a question about or I've moved everything off to the side so I have more room, please let me know. Leave a comment. If you like this video, please subscribe. Click the bell button next to the subscribe so that you can get future um, video announcements. I do plan to do a series of macro um, videos so they will come one after the other, maybe spaced apart. But just let me know what you think, and I will see you guys later. Take care. Bye.